just been going. Good. Yeah. Yeah. Were you, you were at all the public ones? Uh, there's only two, so oh, yeah, yeah. yeah, I was. Yeah. And reactions? Uh, good. Yeah. yeah. I mean, people are uh, telling me the kinds of things I like to hear. They discover things in the films, and yeah. and if if they have problems with it, they're the kind of problems I like. They're yeah. the problems I encourage. <laughs> so. Yeah, How have you found the good. reviews? Um, well, there's just been sort of mini reviews, and yeah. then there's been a couple of long articles, which were really good. I thought the yeah, long I really articles. liked Adam's article and POV. Right. Did you guys want to? Were you targeting Locarno as the as the premiere? Targeting? Yeah, like because it's a great festival, like, and it seems like one that's very much in step with what you're doing. Yeah, the timing was right. Yeah. Um, it. Uh, you know, we just finished the film and they came to look at it in, in Switzerland. And yeah. of course, it's a Swiss co production. But you have ties to Switzerland. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it just made sense on, yeah. on all fronts. So we went with it. Yeah. So I think we're just going to segue straight into the interview. We've probably been rolling. Feels like we've, yeah, we're in yeah. an interview. <laughs> Strangely. <laughs> <laughs> so um, one thing I, I read in the POV article was that this was described as both the most personal and the most difficult of your films, and I was wondering if you could expand on both of those uh, descriptors. I'm not sure about personal, why it's more personal than anything else I've done. Um, probably because my mother's in it, mm. um, so that would suggest, uh, yeah, that suggests something more to do with, with myself, but I think all my films are are personal be also because I shoot them mm. and, and they're really the world seen through me operating a camera mm. and even if I don't appear in them or if I don't speak in them you're really seeing my sensibility and that's a very personal thing. Um, also in the new film there's putting my mother in it and questioning time probably has something to do with an awareness of my own age, my own mortality, you know. I think we all become more aware of that at a certain number. <laughs> and um, I guess that could be read as personal as well. Um, what was the other part of the difficult. question? The difficult. difficult, yeah. Man. No, it's absolutely the most difficult. <laughs> <laughs> because it... it um, yeah, it, it evolved to be a film about time in some respects, and um, it, uh, time is an impossible subject uh, because time um, is really just transformation, um, and everything we look at at any given moment um, is an image of time. So you're at a point where wherever you point the camera, that's what your film's about. And um, in, in parallel, I mean, I guess the film does this too, it questions if time is just a concept. Um, and if, if you were really going to make a film that tried to cover that subject properly, you'd have to make a, a series and you'd have to have uh, many different points of view and different kinds of articulations about ideas of time and I didn't want to do that. so. So it also means you can't say too much because if you say one thing, you have to say all the other things too. So perhaps also that's something that made it uh, become more subjective or more personal and more about um, perception and seeing and seeing through the idea of time. Um, the, so it's about the perception of time uh, as experienced using film. And the DJ even comments that thinking about time is just a very difficult process in general. To, yeah. And, and I'm wondering if it was difficult likewise to film it. And something that occurred to me is that one of the defining features of, of film, or I guess you could say now television or any, we don't call them moving images, I guess, anymore, pixels, but uh, is that they have duration right? versus other art. Yeah. Um, how did you approach filming time? Well, I think... Uh, I mean, I've been working with film for, and it's amazing how, the segue, how much the word time comes up in conversation. It's just, in so many contexts, you use that word. So I was going to say, um, I've been making films for a long time. <laughs> and um, 
in in the process of making films, I was I was aware that it was a kind of time machine, but it never kind of uh, became as profound or dramatic as it has in this film, where yeah. it was like, uh, oh yes, it really um, is, as Tarkovsky says, sculpting in time, and it really is uh, a paradox of time, um, and it it as a media as a ref as a reflection of technology in our today's life, it takes us away from being in the present. Mm. I mean, it's, it's, it's really this grand paradox that technology has given us to um, look at the past and project into the future. I mean, I, if, if I sh shoot with a camera, I feel like I'm in the moment. And when, I, when I'm in that flow, it feels really good. It's one of my favorite experiences. It's, it's, a, it's almost like a, a high. To, to be at one with the camera as things unfold, catching them. But as soon as it's finished, it's um, a thing mm. that, that belongs to the past and, and it's baggage. And it, it's this, this thing that I'm trying to use to, to put into a, an experience for you, the audience, in the future. Mm. And, and my whole relationship to the present has been completely um, you know, set askew <laughs> through, through making film. So, the, I mean, the answer, the simple answer to your question is I just became much more aware of um, the paradoxes implied um, by using film. And you've been described as someone who is, uh, you said, uh, living in the present, but uh, I think it was a French quote that was présent au monde, like, uh, I guess, uh, in the world, in the moment. And uh, it's, it's a film where uh, there is kind of the feeling of an impulsiveness, which has been a mandate in some of your other films, but yeah. there's also the opposite, which is there are some shots that seem very uh, meticulously crafted and choreographed technically. And I'm wondering how that balance was maybe achieved. Which ones uh, where would you be referring to, to the meticulously crafted uh, ones? Some of the, maybe the moving time-lapse photographer se photography seems like it requires, just from a technical standpoint, some kind of planning. Right, yeah. Even if what's depicted is chance, like whatever's happening. Yeah, yeah. Well, I guess that's the thing, I mean, with filmmaking, on the whole, it, it's a difficult um, medium to Im improvise with because, uh, well, it requires a lot of money, so you've got to explain what you're doing in, in the first place. And then um, it requires harnessing technology. And I think you can harness technology to, uh, to a level where you can be pretty spontaneous with it, especially with a camera. But then it bogs down again in editing because you've, you've got a lot of time to um, look at all your material and assemble something and review it. And if anything, you become over familiar with it, you lose the spontaneous connection to it. Um, and it's something that I've been uh, interested in and engaged with from the beginning, is how do you use this medium in a spontaneous fashion or that you don't lose that kind of electricity of discovery along the way, which, which reveals so much, you know. So I have many strategies in all, all ways, including time lapse, um, to, to still stay open to d discovering things, you know. And time lapse is exciting because it, what it really is, it's sort of like a time microscope, right? You, you set it up in your world like as you understand the perception of time, okay, this is our world, so I set up a time lapse and it's going to see something that you can't see because it's seeing it at a different rate. Mm. And um, so y in a way you are improvising, like you said, because you're, you're just sort of allowing something to happen and you don't know what it'll be. And uh, certainly you don't know what the thing in front of the camera is gonna be, uh, especially if it's involving weather. <laughs> Um, and then when you, when you get it back, it's like, oh, you know, you, when you see it shrunk into a, a short span of time, you're seeing gestures and movements and progressions, transformation, time, that you don't see with your normal eyes. So it's, it's, it's kind of like a yeah, time microscope. Were there any kind of technical limitations that you, you mentioned that occurred in this film? Because it seems like in, in many of your films, the points where the technology is limited is kind of a transcendent moment. Like there's an adds a second level where you can't control it. I'm thinking specifically up in the north when one of the, uh, I guess it was a, one of the experts was saying that they just have to pray that 
the camera had functioned properly. Oh, in picture yeah, of light, yeah. yeah. Um, so sorry, the question is if the, the technology yeah, fails, the limits well, of yeah, the technology? Yeah, where you're pushing up against maybe the limits and something unexpected is happening yeah. because of that. I mean, yeah, so, some, of the, some of the most thrilling things, I guess, are things that happen in spite of your, your intentional efforts. Mm. And, and that can that can be a, a technical flaw. That can be. Um, one time I had one roll of film. I was sent to New York for tectonic plates with one roll of film, and and there was all this pressure around you know getting the right shots for this one roll of film, and um, somehow my camera had two buttons on it, two on-off buttons. So the first shot I took, I started with this button. And then I stopped it with this button, but it didn't stop the camera. So my whole, you know, big one roll of film, my 10 minutes of film was shot filming the back of a taxi cab seat. And um, not that that's very exciting, I didn't use it, but things like that are exciting. <laughs> you know, things that happen kind of because of the technology itself or aberrations of the technology. And I like to include those in all the, in all the films that you see. Um, that you that you you see aberrations of the thing you're looking at to to remind you, yeah, this is a constructed illusion, and um, it's in the case of time, it's a construction of time. I mean, there's different references to that in the end of time, mm. um, and even in um, you know earlier dramatic films, I, I would tend to use. Um, things that made you aware of the material or the broadcast or whatever it may be, yeah. With the use of uh, digital technology in this film, there, there are two things I want to kind of put side by side and see if there's something we can take out of them. But one is when you're shooting in low light circumstances, sometimes you're getting kind of that compression or the digital grain or whatever you would call it, um, where there's just not a lot of light. And the other would be the use of digital technology to create like the, the what would that be the grid kind of uh, oh, the, the circular yeah, yeah. animation that's called harmonia yeah so mm -hmm. you have one that is you're you know you're in control of it and the other is it's kind of you're butting up against the limits of the I guess the technology um, well um, let me just preface by saying, I mean, this also goes into the idea of improvisation and editing. Um, I've been involved in uh, designing a software um, for mixing images. Um, and it's, it's made with Touch Designer, the company is called Derivative. And um, so we've, we've been working on something that allows you to perform moving images and sounds and um, you know, to affect them in real time and create a kind of uh, yeah, layered or edited experience uh, on the fly, responding usually to um, music mm. and, and who's also performing and reacting to the image. Um, so there's a, a section of the film that is, is like that and it, it comes after what you're talking about, the harmonious yeah. section. And the harmonia section is um, its own composition made by Bruno de Gesio and Christos Hatzis and their composers. And um, it's a visualization of harmonics. Um, so there's 64 harmonic tones. And um, the first one is a dot, and the second one is two dots, and you join the dots, it forms a line. The third one is a triangle, so it's three dots, and it creates as a triangle, mm -hmm. and uh, the next is four harmonics, and it becomes a square, and so on until there's 64, which creates a kind of almost circular uh, pattern. And um, those are all the all the harmonics that you're hearing are visualized and superimposed across each other, and as they come and go in intensity, they they form that kind of uh, change or pulsing of the of the mandala. So that's a real literal construction, yeah. and it's it's based on old ideas uh, from Plato and Pythagoras and um, the music of the spheres, the the idea of mapping the the, the celestial um, orbs and associating tones to them. So that's where they were going with that, and I saw it, and to me, it 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 um, 
suggests an image of time. It suggests an image of an expanding universe, things like this. But I don't really want to say that in the film. It's more um, a suggestion when it comes in the film to, to other possibilities of time or other ways of seeing time, mm. other dimensions possibly. And then that, full, that sort of moves on into this mixa section, which again is, a, is a, another possibility of image language, of image and sound language, as well as being a representation of time layers that we've experienced in the film. And it's, it's, it's definitely linked to the technological language because it's, it's quite recent that you can, only quite recent that you can do something like that, that you can perform a flow of images and get that kind of result. And, and that's, a, that's a language that comes from today's technology. Just as when they started, you know, the Lumiere brothers, their language began with single images, like the camera was static. And then soon they realized, well, you can have this point of view and you can have the counter point of view. And then, um, what's his name? I forgot his name. Oh, yeah? No, one of the uh, Hollywood guys, Clo <laughs> close ups. Oh, mm. close ups? I can only think of Leone right now. <laughs> yeah, no, uh, anyway doesn't matter, but the language of close-ups and the language of moving camera, that sort of all came out of this, you know, 24 frame per second world of technology no, in, not in the Griffith, camera. Are we talking about Griffith? Yeah, 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 okay, yeah, that's yeah. it, yeah. Well, early cinema tends to crop up a lot in your work, and is there any further influence that it kind of has on this, this project? No. It does? Well, it seems, well, in general, <laughs> it seems like it, and I know, um, like, the, the jury, uh, Forget his last name. His book tends to make that argument that there is the ghost of of Lumiere in, in your work. Mm, yeah. I mean, that's I. I don't think about those things, yeah. so I can't speak to that. I mean, Jerry. Jerry really interpreted my work from his, yeah. uh, you know, context. So. Um, no, my awareness is fairly narrow actually of early films except I recently saw uh, I was in Paris and went to this museum where they have all these old inventions in, in, including uh, you know small particle accelerators and something they called a northern lights generator and uh, um, things you know like things that measure the the planet's um, orbits and so on models fantastically beautiful old stuff and then I saw the, the first cameras, mm. first motion picture cameras and projectors, and had this completely emotional reaction. It came out of the blue, you know, I was really choked up seeing these, these things. And I, I think in part it's, yeah, just that's not that very long ago, really. And, and um, how innocent those inventions were. Also the early cars and airplanes. And now, I mean, the car is a horrible beast that you kind of, fear, <laughs> you fear it's going to destroy the world. But there it was like, what an amazing idea, you know, the steam engine car that can <laughs> move you from, uh, you know, one place to another in, in a time-saving way. It just seems so, that sense of invention and potential was so wonderful. And that, that was really moving, yeah. That seems to relate to the beginning of the film with kind of uh, a historical moment and kind of where the technology is not advanced to the point of fulfilling the curiosity. Of, yeah. But you saw that after having completed the... Yeah, no, this is, I just saw it recently. Mm -hmm. yeah. But yeah, I mean, both Joe Kittinger jumping from space, which is basically the beginning of space flight, um, at least for the Americans, uh, <laughs> and... Um, CERN itself as, as being this scientific pursuit of knowledge. And if you take the science word out of it, it's really just the pursuit of understanding who we are and how things work and what are we doing here. This incredible curiosity and this, this mapping of information um, to, to actually explore dimensions that we're not even sure about exist. I mean, if you talk about the atomic world, you know, something we can't see, and they've established uh, theories of, of our entire existence around that. And the moment of feeling like time had kind of stopped that he describes 
is that something that in the film is a, a, like played like almost an attempt to attain that visually? Uh, that came during the editing. Yeah. That that awareness. Um, I I basically I saw the the footage of him falling online, and then uh, we contacted the source, and they sent us a bunch of tapes to look at further material, and then we pulled that out and constructed the scene. And then in listening to interviews that he had, he started, or he started, I mean, he, I started to realize his experience of falling included this um, timelessness because there was no resistance. So, so in spite of the fact he was moving so fast, he didn't feel it and it, it was like he was suspended. So I kind of interpreted that into a timelessness for, for the film. And that was part of the editing process and I mean a lot of a lot of the things in the film are derived that way you know they're step-by-step -step discoveries of associations that you slowly piece together to create this kind of uh, intertwined dynamic world around certain themes yeah and to clarify that there's at that point in the film there it's it felt like I was hearing sounds that were from earlier in the film and there was a kind of like images that were overlaying from earlier um, is, is that what's occurring? Like, is there a kind of folding in? Yes. Um, you're talking again about the mixing mm. section, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's all made up of images we've seen before, but we're, but we're seeing them in different ways. Mm. Um, some of them are, are sort of, um, have lines going through them that create splits and mir a kind of mirroring. And then there's layers of images in, in depth. The, the time frames are, are jittered in places um, and then there's reference back to the particle accelerator itself and um, the sound is I think the sound there's one sound reference to the train pulling into the train yeah. station where is his Kobo station but I think the rest of the sound is all um, pretty uh, intensely different mm -hmm. and how do you come up against uh, representing the future in that sense um, how do I come up against it? I'm yeah, not sure like it seems like it's like that's the thing you're always, you always you always chase when you're talking about time, and especially a film that's representing it is that yeah. you can deal with the present, you can deal with the past, but how yeah. do you approach? Yeah, I mean my my again intellectual suggestion at that stage is that this is could be uh, a language of the future, a movie of the future, a way of using images and sounds in the future that corresponds to a technology, progression in technology and perhaps also progression in in our own perception and awareness because as we the more we surf and use all that stuff um, the more we're following parallel lines at the same time and also physically like we're constantly checking all these things and combining them together and there will be software that um, if it's not already there that uh, allows you just to take streams that are, are online and combine them together and remix them into your own thing. I mean, that, that's going to happen. Um, so what will that do to our language? You know, are we going to need things explained to us in the same way? Are we going to need narrative structures in the same way? Who knows where that's going to go? But it's, it's a suggestion of that uh, in the film. And it also comes at a point where the film is kind of I mean, I wouldn't say it's a conventional film to begin with, but it has a more conventional kind of structure up to that point because it begins in the atomic world and ends in the in outer space, and you have a nice parenthesis around the structure, and you could end the film there. And then, while you're looking at images of space, it goes into this idea of the future, which suggests different understandings of time, different dimensions, and different use of the film medium. And you described it as not wanting to explain too much, but as you, as you talk about narratives, I found it to be maybe the most uh, lucid in your description of kind of what's going on with your approach to the voiceover versus your use of voiceover in your other films, and I was wondering how you kind of tackled that component in the making of the film. Um, well, by, I don't, I'm not sure how to compare it, but um, the the process in, in both, um, or in all of, all of the last three, uh, was 
that I take notes all the way through. I mean, I'm, I write all the way through like a diary and I yeah, make notations and take quotations from other people and I kind of collect this as it goes along. And then in the editing, I edit down those things that help me kind of determine what the film's about, even if I don't use those phrases and words, and then start to um, record bits and pieces of them and try them out in the, in the flow but they're ever changing until it finds itself, finds its balance. And it's actually the hardest thing to do for me, the voiceover, mm. because you risk saying too much, you risk reducing some, something that is you know, uh, powerful in image and sound only, but if you don't use it, you, you may, like some viewers will go too far astray or need, they, they need some grounding with words. So this is a very delicate um, procedure and it usually goes right to the last minute, like right to the edit, I mean to the mix, like at the end of the mix, it's still like tweaking that, yeah. Like Petropolis uses very little, how did you make the decision for that to kind of save it until almost the very end? Um, same, I mean, it, it, during editing at one point there was a lot of a lot of text and that helped me actually understand what what the film was about but the most of the text came out and it it seemed um I mean, it's not a very long film so it so it seemed the best thing to do was to allow the visceral experience to take you primarily yeah, like and there's lots of films and information about the tar sands already, like that was a big thing, you know, you, you can find out info about it. So this was to be more an experience of it. And, and when that voice came in, it's also kind of like, <laughs> welcome back, you know, and, and um, I made a few comments that I think uh, brought what you'd seen to another level, but, but it's very minimal. Minimal, yeah. How did you arrive at the kind of the ordering of the different sections? It's something that's always interesting to me in your films because it's usually the order is clearly based on the geography, um, but within that order, choosing what what begins it and maybe the arrangement of those sections. Yeah, uh, it, it's sort of a combination of rational, structural thought, and it's just feeling right, mm. and. You know, it, it's also probably the same uh, part of the brain that composes music makes those decisions. Um, because if you you know if you're composing a piece of music, you, you're not justifying why you're going from one movement mm. to another, why that movement changes. It just sounds right and feels right. And so a lot of my choices are made in that way. Although you have to at the same time be aware of, okay, well, what am I introducing the film with? What are the ideas that were being presented first? And how do the things that follow relate to that? And where does it end up? Of course, you know, it's, 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 it's that kind of structure too. So, you know, there were, CERN, for example, wasn't always at the beginning of the film. It, uh, I think in the early edits, it began, began in the jungle. Oh, wow. It was more, um, yeah, a natural environment, and CERN appeared somewhere throughout. And in fact, at one point, Petropolis, that material, was part of this film. Oh. Because uh, it was made during the development of, of, um, of this film, but then it became clear that it should be its own film. <laughs> and, you know, so these things move around and, and take on different, different uh, positions, I guess, of, of meaning. Um, and my mom also used to be at the beginning of the film. You know, she was the first person uh, that was asked, what is time? Oh, really? Yeah. So things, things in this film migrated mm -hmm. a lot. Whereas in Gambling Gods, um, one of the rules of that film yeah. was that it would remain chronological. Um, and it, and we, we, we stuck to that. And because I think it's also very much a film about the, the logic of experience of how things unfold and, and I wanted to respect that to see what happened, to, to be able to live with the mystery that's contained in that. And for me, it's actually the film I like still, even after making The End of Time. It's the film I like 
to watch the most because I understand it the least. <laughs> I've controlled it the least, you know. And do you have a transcendental experience watching it then? Like I wouldn't go that far. <laughs> <laughs> so there's the too too many memories of all the work involved and you know the technique and what you're doing. Yeah. That's the thing. I mean. Ideally, a film will will offer that to to its audience, but but the people making it, there's there's so much work behind it that you can't shake off. You, you know, you you're living through, you're reliving that mix, you're reliving that shooting day, you're reliving the politics of whatever whoever you were dealing with, and that that's what it's symbolic of when you watch it. Well, that rule reminds me of kind of like improvisational musicians and maybe like a John Zorn rules that like uh, govern a, an improvisation. Yeah. And the avant-garde's always had a, a, a through line in your work and I'm wondering with, with the new film, it seems like that's the, the mix of sections, maybe the section people have the most difficulty with. And I was wondering if you could talk maybe about where the avant-garde is with you now versus maybe when you started. Hmm. Um, I guess uh, what what I'm aware of. I mean, I I don't even really want to call it the avant-garde so much. It's it's more um, using form and exploration that at the one time can speak to an audience that they're familiar with, but at the same time can can provoke seeing something in a different way or, or understanding something in a different way. And ideally, that that different way uh, is actually directly applied to the subject that you're exploring. Like, that's not just for the sake of it, but that it has something to do with what you're looking at. Um, and I mean, the latter is an avant-garde tendency, uh, or it's a tendency of, of art in general, and the former, the the, the you know, the narratives and stories and forms that, that are kind of encouraged by the commercial world are exactly that. They're, they're from a, a more mainstream culture. And I don't know, for some reason early on, I decided to tread those, those two paths because I felt it was in the interest of understanding our, our, um, our place and our perception of our place in, in deeper, more constructive ways. I mean, that's kind of the altruistic <laughs> aspect of it, and that that has stuck. So that's not really different now than it was before. And even before, you know, I would make a film like, I don't know if you're familiar with Eastern Avenue. So I didn't, that wasn't made for anybody. That was really made for myself. Um, it was like a diary and, and uh, you know, that could have been a path I pursued that I just work totally like an artist would, you know, you just feel what you feel and you go there and you don't understand it and you satisfy yourself. And, um, but instead I chose what I just explained. But the mixa thing now in this software is perhaps in live performance is something again like Eastern Avenue where, where you can, you, you can do it, you can have a performance without having to raise a whole bunch of money, you can have an audience or not, you, you know, you're, you're creating something that's live and on the spot and possibly impermanent if you don't record it, and uh, it's, it's free for you to discover uh, in the process of making it. So, so I'm doing that too, <laughs> doing both things still, yeah. And, and you now you have a collaborator a collaboration with your your composers that's now been for two straight films is that correct um, Shopless and mm -hmm. Time. and but when you keep describing kind of the live performance element I'm also I'm I'm envisioning examples I've seen where the live visuals are done by someone and the live music is done by someone else is mm -hmm. that a kind of collaboration that you're interested in now as opposed to, like music's always been important but now you have specific individuals that yeah you, that's what we've been doing yeah um, but it's been very there's very many shades of that yeah. and um, Fred Frith is the musician I've been doing most of those performances with and they're really they're complete Im improvs and we react to each other and I also have with the images sometimes sound elements mm -hmm. Also, the sound of the image that you see, and so those get mixed in as as well. 
And um, is, is yeah, does that the answer to yeah. the question? Yeah, and okay. it seems like to, to broaden it a bit that that's a direction you're being pulled in maybe more than the documentary at this point. Like, because you've always been a hybrid uh, of different different elements, but it seems like that's the most like the strongest element of the new film. Yeah, maybe in some ways it it is. It, there's a a lot invested into it. Let's yeah. say like there's a lot of energy put into even on the level of getting that software to work. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's actually doing those performances. You really put yourself on the line because you don't know if it's going to work and and like technically, <laughs> you're not prepared, and and you know you've got an audience watching with their expectations of, of something, and uh, that's kind of thrilling. <laughs> whereas whereas, um, well, I guess the film is filmmaking is, is the same thing. Somebody, some composer, I think it was Schoenberg, said composition is improvisation done slowly. <laughs> you know. Um, and in a way it is, um, but, but that, that being pressured to react and perform in, in, the, in the moment um, allows you to come across things that are not so considered, which are sometimes much more interesting, not more interesting, but are really interesting um, in a different way that you would not have arrived at if you had the time to, to try and figure it out. I like that you mentioned expectations because that's one thing I'm curious with as documentaries become more widely visible, there, it seems like there's an expectation of them that never used to exist. It seems like documentaries used to be operating different spheres and now it seems like the expectation is to push them in the didactic kind of transmission of information. I'm you think so? if you've noticed mm -hmm. that in your... Well, I've noticed both. Um, I mean, I've actually been quite happy where well, for, let's start back a bit further. I mean, one of the problems is all these genre, like the name documentary or the name experimental or narrative, like they're such limiting genres, right? Um, you would never limit music to that degree. Um, there, because, of course, there's an endless amount of ways of combining and varying these things. So documentary, what does that mean anyway? Um, and the good thing that I've seen in documentary, I mean, when I started with Picture of Light, um, it was, you know, at the time fairly abnormal to make a film that essayistic way and that it had a lot of um, poetic license, I guess. Um, and now that's, you know, that's kind of an accepted, acknowledged, uh, there's not really a category for it, but a way of documentary film, especially in Europe, that you see running through all the documentary festivals. It's um, welcomed that the subjective nature of looking at our world is part of the document. You know, it doesn't have to be cinema verite, or it doesn't have to be um, shot in a, a certain speak to be a documentary. It's it's. The real document is our perception, right? It's how we look at things. And so on the one hand, that is growing. And on the other hand, you have, which tends to be an American tendency. Shark Week. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Or, well, I mean, I watch that stuff too. I like especially airplane crashes. <laughs> but, um, but that's just a whole other thing. It's a whole other kind of use of, of the media and of observation. And it's very reductionist and, and sensational. But then you also, you mentioned, you also have the informational, you know, which have been very important films in terms of giving important information to the world. Um, so I, I would never dis dismiss those, but it's not what interests me personally so much. And in fact, they're kind of, like in the case of Petropolis, it's kind of good they exist because you know, because other films exist about the tar sands that tell you what's going on, you can lighten up on the informational level and create an experience for the audience that that they already are somewhat informed about. Mm. Yeah, so there's good good sides to it too. Uh, would you say that the subjective one is like the legacy of Marker at this point, or in part? Yeah. I, I mean, he certainly with Sans Soleil, especially. Uh, 
created a kind of milestone um, and that many people responded to and it, it kind of al allowed a lot of people to feel they could work that way, which is fantastic. But Markers, ironically Markers, that film is full of text too, yeah, right? Yeah. <laughs> to, to the degree that you're bombarded and you can't and understand it, you know, like you really have to watch that film and decipher it on, on that level if, if you want to, if you want to get everything that's being spoken. But there's other filmmakers, um, one who, who's very dear to me in that regard is Johan van der Kuyken. And he's not very well known over here, but I mean, pretty much from the beginning he had that exploratory approach. And, you know, it's sometimes they're, they're rigorous formal structures that you can recognize, but at other times, like Amsterdam Global Cities is a five hour film, and, you know, he'll, you don't know what to expect. Like, suddenly you'll be spending a long time in one scene that goes on and on and on for that scene, and then you move through several other scenes really quickly, you come to something else long, and it doesn't, it doesn't correspond to a, a predetermined structure that we're, we understand commonly. Rather, it follows the logic of experience, of, I guess, his experience making the film, and, and I, I think I, that affected me uh, strongly seeing his films, yeah. Well, it seems like your films are almost an evolution of kind of the city symphony where they become kind of the global symphony. Like, is, is that something that uh, you've considered the, the, the concept of the, the global in your films? Yeah, I guess, I mean, somehow I fall into big themes and I, would, I don't think they're global, but they do, they do span a few cultures, you know, but global is going too far. <laughs> Except that you often see the perspective of um, space towards Earth somehow. Like you understand that dynamic of the whole Earth in the, in the big picture. But, um, but, but that's a literally superficial understanding of the, of the planet, you know, as an orb. It's by no means uh, anywhere near global actually if you think of all the things going on in the world. Well even from space you can only see. Exactly. Part, yeah. 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 And then that's built kind of into like that irony is built into the title of Petropolis almost with the, the aerial component because it's 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 so focused in its subject but it's so kind of far from from that. Yeah, right. Yeah. And um, the information, going back to that point, there's not a lot that's provided. Yeah. Um, I was also wondering if the uh, the concept of historiography in the new film and kind of historiography yeah like um, you're documenting a certain point in time obviously with the title but it's also raising the awareness of the documentation so historiography being like the consideration of how history is written hmm. and in this sense I'm thinking like how time is recorded right and especially I think more so with the Detroit passage than anything else that this you have this feeling of a moment in time, and even with the opposite being the slow recording of time with the, uh, the Hawaii section. I, I almost filmed in Pompeii um, and going through Rome. Um, I, w I would have thought about historiography more concretely, but I, I think in the film as it is, I don't actually think about it that much, it, except as you say, you know, um, Detroit was chosen, in fact, for for the visible eras that can be seen there. You know, uh, so I guess actually, yes, there there is in in Detroit a visibility of of a distant history um, in the monuments, which are in that case the the neighborhoods and the factories, um, and you you see the natural world encroaching. Uh, upon them again, like you see that they're they're going to be gone soon. Um, at the same time, Detroit also was chosen for techno, for the digital age, um, techno being born in Detroit. Um, and elsewhere in the film, maybe my floorboards. Um, 
which, you know, you can see all these layers of paint. And I stripped that floor mm. and found, found these layers of history. The house is like 110 years old. Um, so it's kind of a, a visualization of history. And I filmed stuff in Hawaii quite a bit, actually. And there's a section, you know, when we're editing, we group things um, certain ways. And one of the groups was archaeology. Mm. And it included the rusty cars that you see in Detroit. So again, there's sort of a, a suggestion of an age, of an era there. But um, there was also the Hawaiian culture, the Polynesian culture, where they used lava rock um, you know, to build the walls of their homes. And one of the things that, this is a random detail, but uh, one of the things I found most fascinating that they still do today, it's all black, but they take um, little white pieces of coral and they outline the, the pathway with the white pieces of coral. And I saw them, but I didn't really think much of them until it got dark. Because when it gets dark, you actually lose all the contrast and detail of the black. So you don't know where the path is anymore, but these white things are lighting up as though they were lights, you know? It's really fantastic. So it's like early, use of early technology, white on black. And um, so I did film stuff like that, but it, it, it didn't sort of, I don't think it made it in, into the film in a very conscious way. Well, thank you, Peter. Good, thanks, that was great. Good questions. We could go longer if it wasn't for the fact that our class is now about to. Oh yeah. <laughs>